Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. Power word, shit. Be me, usual D&D GM for the group. A player wants to DM the next campaign and wants to run a test one shot. Let's call this player Little Orc. Little Orc starts prepping. Tells me and two other friends to make level 5 characters. I ask him if this is going to be a serious one shot. He says no, you can troll as much as you want. So I send him my character, Jorgulho. His name is a fusion of the words George and Cobblestone, but in Portuguese. His traits are being a loud communist and a charlatan. His flaw is that he is hypocritic. His bonds are covalent and metallic, yeah. His allies and connections are just a list of medieval versions of real communists. Little Orc laughs and says that's genius. Fast forward to the session. We get to the bad ending. A demon beg we apparently could never beat shows up and everybody knows it's over. Jorgulho looks the guy straight to the eye and casts command, shit. The guy fails his save, and indeed, shits. Everybody losing their collective shit, in character and out of character. Little Orc gets desperate and tries to describe his boss killing everybody in the most baddest way he can. All players saying man, just stop, he shat his pants, there is no way we'll ever respect him. Bard roasting the demon in game. Demon throws everybody from an unserviable fall. Bard casts feather fall and continues roasting the boss while falls. Jorgulho is killed but everybody else escapes safely. Little Orc is clearly mad. The lesson Little Orc learned? Don't say yeah you can troll nor allow a character with covalent and metallics for bonds if you don't want your boss to shit his pants. The absolute chaos of the all rogue one shot. Be me, DM. Be not me, Elkson, half elf assassin 3, fighter 2. Marketh, human rogue, shadow sorcerer 3. Bob, Drow Assassin 5. Gregorio, Lightfoot Halfling Assassin 5. Yoshi, he never gave me a name for his character, but we'll call him Yoshi because that was his character name in a previous campaign. See the full character arc of Clippius, Angel of the Three Coins, Descent into Avernus Spoilers, High Elf Assassin 5. Schultus, Human Arcane Trickster 5. So, the campaign began with the party being tasked by the leader of the Mafia to assassinate King Meiji and Ive of Nashuta. They are sent to the town of Aurati to meet a contact who can help them get past the king's two archmage bodyguards. Also, the Mafia boss tells them that he suspects that one of their number is a traitor, and that, book, I have told the traitor who they are in PMS during character creation. Unbeknownst to the party, I have contacted every one of them telling them they are the traitor, for different reasons each. The party proceeds to a caravan service, and bullies the caravan leader with mafia influence into giving them not only a free 3 day ride to Alrati, but all of his money as well. During the trip to Alrati, the following chaos happens overnight. Night 1. Schulter stealths out of his wagon and casts fog cloud, obscuring everything. Yoshi poisons all the food. Everyone succeeds con saves though, and nothing really happens. Night 2. Bob burns down a wagon, and Yoshi breaks the wheels on a different wagon. Night 3. Gregorio draws a crude symbol on sleeping Oxen's face. They arrive in Alrighty, and immediately Scholtus casts grease on a random building, and throws a torch at it. The fire begins to spread to the rest of the town, and Scholtus casts fog cloud again and stealths away. While the rest of the party argues, Bob stealths away to follow and kills Schultus. Schultus has the alert feet however, and they have a short battle before the Mafia's contact intervenes. They all meet the contact at his hut, where they are given the man's prototype mage bolt, a crystal arrow he says will ignore any magical defenses. An arcana check reveals it is from another plane. On the way back, Marketh casts darkness as a subtle spell, and everyone panics as they don't know he's a sorcerer and think someone else did it. They arrive back at the caravan, and travel back to Alrati. On the way, the following happens overnight. Night 1. 
Elks and spies on Schultus. Night 2. Schultus tells me that if anyone enters his wagon, he will cast grease on them and throw a torch at them. Elkson tells me he will spy on Schultus. I tell him, all of a sudden you are covered in grease. Schultus throws a torch at you. You are on fire. I tell Schultus Elkson is looking into his wagon, and that he is now on fire. He tells me he casts prestidigitation to make it sound like he is yelling boo. Behind Elkson. Elkson yells boo back. Yoshi is awake and just sees Elkson stumble out of Schultus wagon while on fire and yelling boo. Yoshi steals the party's gold and buries it underground. The party wakes up and finds Gregorio and the gold gone, and assume he ran off with it. Night 3. Marketh asks Schultus to kill someone. Elkson talks to Schultus, and Schultus tells him that Marketh was planning on killing him. Marketh casts message on Schultus. And Schultus lies that Elkson had planned to kill Marketh. Marketh casts message on Elkson, and asks Elkson to help him kill Schultus. Elkson, confused, runs away. He returns in the morning. The party wakes up to find the caravan leader gone. They try to track him, but find nothing. Schultus is annoyed that nobody had killed anyone else, and confessed about all the confused murder plots that night. As they plan how to kill the king. The following occurs in private messages with me as the intermediary. Elkson convinces Marketh and Yoshi to help him kill Schultus. Bob decides to kill Schultus. Schultus is blissfully unaware of all of this. The party decides that Marketh will cast Mold Earth to tunnel under the palace. As they tunnel, Bob stabs Schultus from behind. Marketh collapses the tunnel on Bob and Schultus. Both manage to get out from under the rubble. Bob ends up separated from the others by the wall of rubble, and escapes to the surface. Schultus finds himself facing Elkson, Marketh, and Yoshi. Yoshi stabs Schultus. Elkson stabs Schultus. Schultus is very low. Marketh casts magic missile, knocking out Schultus and giving him two failed death saves. Schultus fails his final death save. Marketh casts Thunderwave as a quickened spell twice. Smashing Elkson and Yoshi against the walls. Elkson and Yoshi attack him. Marketh collapses the tunnel fully. Having a higher constitution modifier than Elkson and Yoshi, Marketh waits until they've suffocated and casts Mold Earth again to reform the tunnel. He exits to the surface and runs away. Meanwhile, Gregorio the Changeling, who, on night 2, had murdered the caravan leader, taken the caravan leader's form, then, on night 3, killed Bob and taken his form, who had escaped the tunnel with the mage bolt, requests an audience with the king. He convinces the king to talk to him alone without the two archmage, abjuration wizard, guards. He stabs the king with the mage bolt, bringing him down to one hit point in one strike. He kicks the king. The king dies. Gregorio transforms into the king and walks out into the throne room where the archmages are waiting. He proceeds to fire the archmages, Claiming they failed to protect him from a cunning attempt on his life. He sits on the throne, now the king of Nashuta, with nobody the wiser. Mission success. Rural is a great app available on the Apple and Google Play Store as well as desktop for creating beautiful 8-bit character art. The app has 14 supported races, 150 plus weapons, 400 plus armor pieces for you to mix and match, 20 plus mini bases. There is that much to work from I was able to make Cold Steel the Hedgehog, the God Emperor of Mankind, Pepe and they are always adding more artwork. The app also has a character sheet to help keep track of everything during games. And if that wasn't enough you can play about with the app for free with limited artwork. So go ahead check it out and if you decide to buy the app use promo code NICKBEDIA for 10% off and it lets them know we sent you. It's a great sponsor and a great app and we hope you guys go ahead and check it. But let's get back to the video. Sometimes you gotta just walk away from a group. Be me, DM. Be not me, Bard, Fighter, Wizard. Bard player had been a problem in previous games but I decided to give them another chance. We begin the session. Goes reasonably well at first. Bard player starts dictating group choices without consulting anyone. Fighter and Wizard are visibly upset by this. 
fighter doesn't know their character abilities, despite telling me he'd learn them before the game. Wizard is great, absolutely the best. Bard player keeps trying to do impossible shit, like squeezing through holes smaller than her head. Wizard is the only one who follows any plot hooks. Fighter seems completely disinterested. Fight breaks out over MacGuffin. Enemies grab MacGuffin and bolt. Wizard gives Jace. Fighter and Bard grapple one and beat on it instead of chasing the item. Wizard uses spells creatively. Fighter and Bard keep hitting the one enemy they grappled. Wizard manages to complete quest via creativity and cleverness before the other players have finished killing the single enemy they were fighting. End the session. Bard complains there wasn't enough for her to engage with, after completely ignoring what I put in front of her. Decide to not complete the rest of the campaign we had planned, say it's due to scheduling. The little kamikaze that could be me, packed of the chain warlock with a pseudo dragon familiar, Jimmy. Final session of a year and a half long campaign. Beg is a black dragon, brother of my patron a silver dragon. Whole campaign has been a proxy competition between the two for the last dragon egg in the world. All the other dragons besides them and their brain damage sister are dead. Beg mind controls sister and sets her up as our competition for the final fight over the egg. Patron does nothing to stop this. Managed to break the mind control. Patron tacitly approves when Beg tries to restart the fight. Jimmy flies up to where the two are quietly talking to each other so I can listen in. Jimmy is conveniently also equipped with all the explosives our party's artificer has been collecting for the past several months I roll in a bag of holding. Dragons eventually notice and Patron tries to explain things through Jimmy. Patron fails to notice his hypocrisy and calls me an insolent fool when I point it out. Screw this. JPEG. Order Jimmy to leap at Beg who is hovering close by. Patron is rapidly severing my connector both him and familiar. Right before I lose contact see Jimmy drop the bombs right on Beg's head. 3. 2. 1. 256 d8 points of damage. Even burning a legendary resistance it does nearly 500 damage. Beg disintegrates in an instant. Jimmy also disintegrates. Patron severed his connect to me. No spells means no summon familiar. I nearly cried. Jimmy was too good for this world. Use class features wisely, they can only be used once. Be me, 5e e monk. Be not me, DM who goes hard when mentioning I rolled a monk and looks as if he doesn't have a clue what to do with it. Have rough start. Level 2. Use patient defense for the first time versus. Minibus. DM baffled I can dodge as bonus action. After that, constantly targeted by enemies doing grapples instead of disadvantage attacks, even dumb beasts. Hit level 4. Take prodigy feat, expertise in acrobatics. Roll 27 to avoid yet another grapple. DM realizes I have godly acrobatics now. Never grappled ever again. Level 7. Facing giants. Go up a tree and call to distract them. Give party chance to set up an ambush. DM grins. Describe slowly what happens next. Giant pauses. Giant looks at me. Giant bends over and picks up boulder. Giant throws boulder. Hit. 32 damage. Roll d10, reduce damage by 19. DM asks what I'm doing. Point at deflect missiles. After several readings, DM agrees I can do that. Never have a single solitary pebble thrown at me for the rest of the campaign ever again. Level 10, get poison immunity. Already realized I'll only ever use it once. Keep my trap shut, dutifully roll saves and take poison damage when called for. Save it for a big one. Eventually face green dragon. Green dragon breathes poison cloud. Pretend to have light bulb moment, flip through player's handbook. Wait, I'm immune to poison. DM looks like I just took a dump on his burger. Nothing ever tries to poison me again. I just hit 14 and got diamond soul. Can't wait to see what happens when DM realizes I can reroll saves and I'm proficient in all of them. If the trend holds, I might have gained spell immunity, as no spell will ever try to target me again. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us.
If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. The greatest edgelord that never was. GM starting a new campaign. Asks us all to make characters and bring them for a session zero. We go around the table, introducing our character's name, race, class, and a short bit of information about them. My turn comes up. I clear my throat, and in my best, gruff voice, give this introduction. Name? Midnight Shadow Blade. Race? Drow Half Elf. Class? Sorcerer of Shadow. Midnight was born of the unholy union of a drow priestess and a human assassin. There was no love in their marriage, only a like-minded obsession with creating the perfect killing machine. Midnight was born with the nimbleness and rugged good looks of his human father and the natural affinity for dark magic as his elven mother. He is the ultimate product of a deliberately broken home, with the power to kill using shadows and cunning. Cue everyone groaning. The rest of the party introduces themselves. The GM sets up a tavern scene, and asks us to begin ripping. A cloaked figure strides gracefully to the center of the tavern. His dark hood barely hiding an even darker complexion contrasted with startlingly white hair. Party groans harder. With a flick of his hand, he knocks back his cloak dramatically, revealing a rainbow of bright colors on its underside and a sequin vest that illuminates everything with color like a living disco ball. Double quote. I proceed to strike a joy pose. Consider this tavern blessed by my arrival. The great midi is here to party. Now who wants to buy me a drink? I proceed to play the most over the top flamboyant shadow sork of all time. Through play, I later reveal that midi rebelled against his parents edgy ways and decided to be an adventurer to better show off his magnificence. His parents are alive, and currently on a mission to kill midi for messing up their reputation through my character's good deeds. Fear midi, the anti-edgelord. Breaking the Geneva Convention, how to win by surrendering. Be me, first level wizard in 5e. Be not me, rogue, fighter, sorcerer, druid, cleric. Be exploring a ruined castle for the local drow village. They told us about this old fort with an armory full of powerful weapons. Nobody can get inside as it is protected by stone sentinels. We arrived to see a bog moat that definitely looks dangerous. Only way over is a stone walkway into a gatehouse. Four huge statues stand guard at the gatehouse. We approach. None shall pass. Holograil. PNG. This fort is at war. None may enter without the Lord's permission. Look past the statue. Fort hasn't been inhabited in decades. Wait. Walk forward and hold out my arms. I surrender. DM goes silent. DM makes a small sound. DM silence continues. Statue reached forward and grips me in its hand. I surrender. Please convey me to your commander so I may be disarmed and imprisoned. Statue turns and walks to the heavy portcullis. It lifts it with one hand, shoves me under, drops the portcullis. The second portcullis is also down, but appears old and rusted. We can easily get through it. Send familiar to inform party. Party also surrenders. Also shoved inside gatehouse. We break through the second gate. Fort successfully infiltrated. Totally stole the idea from Doctor Who. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.